Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, church. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Man, it is so good to be here with all of you just worshiping Jesus this morning. Amen? Yeah. Well, as many of you know, we love celebrating our first-time guests here. So can we just get loud for anybody that's here for their first time today? Yeah, if you're, if you're a first-time guest, we just want to say a special welcome home to you. We're so excited that you're joining us today, and we want to meet you and give you a free gift. So you'll find these green Connect cards on the seat backs in front of you or the QR codes. You can go ahead and scan it, turn it into the green table at guest services. We just want to meet you, and like I said, give you a free gift. We're excited that you're here this morning. And church, you also know that we love reminding each other of why, why we're here, why this church, church exists. So if you know it, you can say it with me. But we exist to lead people to Christ in their God-given purpose. Yes, I love that. I swear we have more people saying it with me every week. I love that so much. And you also know that we like to get hype or excited when we have um, decisions for Christ. So get ready to get loud because last week we had one more decision for Christ. Yes, and we celebrate that because every, every name is a person and every person has a story and we love hearing about your guys' story. So again, church, thank you so much for just actively living out this purpose statement as, as you leave the doors. Now, many of you also probably know that it's this big day called Mother's Day. Yeah, if you haven't said Happy Mother's Day to your mom, go ahead and do that. But if you are a mom in the room, go ahead and raise your hand. We have a gift for you. Keep it up. Yeah, we love celebrating the moms. I just love that we get to have a day to celebrate the people that raised us, the people that, that made us who we are today. Just thank you so much for the moms in this room. We love you. We appreciate you. And honestly, we can't do enough to give back to you guys what you've given to us. So just thank you so much. Now, we're able to do stuff like this, giveaways. We're able to have ministries because of you guys and because of you guys being faithful in your giving. So just want to say thank you so much for everyone here that does give. There are four ways I believe that you can do it. You'll see them on the screen behind me. I know it's a little distracting. They're still passing out. I'm sorry. I don't want to wait five minutes though to get through this. But um, if you're interested in giving, there are ways on the screen behind me. My husband and I um, give online. And like I said, we're just so thankful that you guys do that. And we like to remind you that you're not just giving to a building. You're giving to life change. You're giving to eternity. Pastor Monty always talks about this rope up here. And this little red mark is an example of, of us today in, in our time. And you're not giving just to that little mark. You're giving to eternity. You're giving to lives changed. So thank you so much for doing that. And like I said earlier, we have this ministry called the One for One Ministry. And if you don't know what it is, what it is is we bring up a dollar every um, week and we put it in the, in the clear boxes. And then at the end of the month, we count up all the dollar bills and we cut a check to someone that you guys nominate. And you've probably heard it if you've been coming the last couple weeks, but last month we had not one, not two, but three one-for-ones picked. Yeah. Yeah, we had two separate people say that they were going to match the one-for-one. So I'm going to read all three stories right now. Bear with me. But it's really exciting to hear how God is moving in the heart of his people and in the community around us. So this first person wrote, this morning, my husband went to work like any normal day. When he arrived, he went in for his meeting like they do every morning. He walked into an office of people crying. He had no idea what was going on. When he asked what happened, they told him that the owner's son had gotten hit by a semi that morning and tragically passed away. My husband called me right away sobbing as he's telling me his friend had died. He could barely mutter the words as he didn't know what to think or say. Not only that, but this family also lost their daughter to suicide last year. Now they've lost their son, the only two children they had. Both died at very young ages. 
This family has had so much grief, and I pray that God places his hand on their marriage and them as they go through another traumatic loss. It is unknown if they are a part of a church, but I want them to feel the love of God poured onto them. I know they're probably thinking, why us? Why our children? Maybe if they see a card or this nomination, they'll feel his hand over them. And church, you get to be the church and give them money. I'm going to save how much we're giving them until the last story, but keep that family in your prayers. This other nomination says, I would like to nominate a family that I met several months ago. The mom was so kind and thanked me for the work I do as a teacher. Her and her husband have two boys in second and third grade. On the evening of April 4th, their mom was hit on, hit head on by a drunk trucker, drunk, sorry, drunk driver. She was like, she will likely be in the hospital for at least three weeks and then at a rehab facility. Miraculously, it was just bone damage as far as they can tell, and she doesn't have any internal injuries. Praise God. She's had four surgeries so far, has another scheduled, and will likely need several more over the rest of her life. She obviously can't work, and her husband owns his own one-man business, so he's struggling now. I don't know where she stands in her faith, but I know a gift like this one-for-one would make a huge impact toward daily expenses and the lives of this family as they all heal from such a traumatic experience. And then this last one, they said, I would like to nominate my mom for the one-for-one. She was a single mom of two kids a year apart for 19 years. She never let us worry or know the struggles we went through. I grew up wondering how my mom always kept a smile on her face in every tough situation. Though we didn't consistently go to church, growing up she always turned us to God. She provided everything for us, no matter what it took. She worked three jobs, and I never felt she wasn't there for us. Fast forward some years, and she had a baby at 40 years old. He was her blessing. Nine months later, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. This crushed her. After almost losing her baby boy, she turned to the church. Things were going amazing. It made me feel so happy that we got to find God together until she fell out of going to church. Though she is still a hard-working, happy mom, I know she's tired. She doesn't get to sleep well at night because she's taking care of her son. Then today I got a call. My mom went to an appointment, and long story short, there's a possibility of breast cancer. She's exhausted and knows she needs to go to church, but it's hard for her. She has to continue taking care of her patients at the hospital while struggling with her own life. I would like to give this one-for-one one to my mom to remind her God is still with her and always will be, and to keep going. I want her to know the church is here for her and everyone loves her. And to all the moms out there, you're doing good. Keep going. Your kids appreciate everything you do, and you're superheroes. Man, I love hearing these stories about the one-for-ones. This is being the church, just giving to people that are hurting and need hope. So church, get excited because we got to give each one of these people $1,049.65. Can you guys give God some praise? Amen. Come on, keep the praise going. God is good. He's so good. Wow. Man. That's so cool to hear. I love that. And you're making an eternal impact. You're making an eternal difference. Welcome to Meadows Church again. I know it's been said probably a few times since you walked in. My name is Sarah, but again, from me to you, welcome, welcome home, especially if it's your first time here. I want you to say somebody to your right or to your left, words matter. Tell them words matter. Words do matter. They do. It's true. Found this out at a very young age. Don't know how many of you know this, uh, but my brother, Bryce, behind me here, we grew up together, of course, being brothers that we are. Uh, and in the spirit of Mother's Day, as I'm preparing for a message talking through James 3 and how words matter and how important the power of the tongue is, I thought there's no better story to start with than this, right? To be able to throw my brother under the bus to start things off. So... I don't know if I had some ulterior motive. You know, I know ladies, when you get your hair done, it takes a long time, typically, right? So I appreciate the investment. And, and when I was a kid, I understood this, right? It takes a long time for women to get their hair done. So my mom came home one day, and she had her hair done really nice. And I was like, wow, 
mom, I love your haircut so much. You look so young. And I was probably like 10 years old or whatever. I don't know what I was at the time. But and I don't know if I had some ulterior motive like, man, I want to ask my mom for something later. I might as well get this compliment in now, right? But I, I said something nice, and she was like blown away. She's like, wow, thank you so much, Sarah. That's so nice of you to say. And Bryce, being the good man that he is, thought, you know what? I need to say something nice as well because I want to receive the, the affirmation from mommy too. And so he did. He said, Mom, I love your haircut. You don't look ugly anymore. <laughs> All right, thanks, worship team. Love you guys. No, I'm just <laughs> uh, But my mom, of course, has been telling that story for like 25 years, and I just, I just think it's a perfect happy Mother's Day to all mothers in the room. Uh, love you all so much and so grateful. And speaking of encouragement, as I was getting ready to prepare this message, I found it just to be so fascinating that, man, you know how the word just kind of hits you. It speaks to you uh, at the perfect time, right? It just says the right thing at the right time. Pastor Monty asked me a couple months ago, hey, would you do a message on this day on James chapter 3? And I said, absolutely, I would love to do that. So as I'm preparing for the message, I open up James 3. And James, he's such an encouraging guy. Check out what it says, verse 1. Verse 1 here. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. Wow. I was like, man, James, you're a good guy, man. Uh, but it's true, right? He says, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. And I thought, what a confidence builder. Hey, you want to teach in the church? Not many should do it. It's like when you raise your hand. Hey, can I get a volunteer? You raise your hand, and they're like, does anybody else want to volunteer? Um, no, it reminded me of this quote from Star Wars. Qui-Gon Jinn says to Jar Jar Binks, the quintessential idiot of Star Wars, he says, the ability to speak does not make you intelligent, right? So just a little humility check before the message preparation got going on. But I love this series. James, we're talking about James. The series title, the sermon series that we're in, it's called Faith in Action. And I love, love, love the book of James. And specifically, I, I love what I get to talk about today. But the one thing that I've always remembered from the book of James is what we talked about last week and really what the sermon series is titled after. It's called Faith in Action. And it's after a verse in James chapter 2 that says, faith without works is what? Dead or faith without action is meaningless, or whatever translation you want to use, that is the number one most prevailing thing that I have found, James, you know, to stick with me throughout the years. And I just absolutely love it because it's challenging, right? It's challenging, and it, it, it cuts to the deepest part of ourselves. And uh, I just want to quick, you guys, you guys are totally good. Yeah, thank you, honestly. Um, let's give honor to the worship team. They killed it this morning. I love it. Love it. Faith in action. We talked last week about how what we declare pales in comparison to what we demonstrate, right? And by that, what do we mean? We mean, of course, if you say something and you believe it, but you don't live it out, it's pointless, right? It means, it means nothing. It's dead. We talked about how it's dead faith to believe something and do nothing about it. And I love that statement, that what we declare matters very little compared to what we demonstrate. But the heart of that statement is not to say that what you declare doesn't matter. Words matter. What you say matters. But what James says is also true. Faith without action is dead because like we learned last week, what can dead faith do? What can dead faith do? It can't do anything. What kind of movements happen from dead faith? Dead faith or deceptive faith like we talked about last week as well, that's an understanding, knowing who God is, what he's asking you to do, and staying in the seat, doing nothing about it, right? We talk a lot about declaring, demonstrating, but James, I think, through the Holy Spirit, wants us all to know today that words matter. Words are not unimportant. In fact, your words carry supernatural weight, right? What you speak is often reflective of what you believe in here, about yourself, about others, about God, about who God is, what he's capable of doing. Nobody's perfect. James reminds us we're all on the same playing field. He says it in verse 2. Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We're not perfect, right? We can't control ourselves in every other way. Not by our own power, at least, but the Holy Spirit in us. we got to believe that 
something can change, that we can be transformed by a renewing of our mind, amen? That we can change the way we think and that God can change our heart to do something different, to live a different life. We need to understand what God's word says so that we can speak it over our lives, so that we can believe it and then live it out, amen? Amen. I want you to open your Bibles. I forgot to tell you this. Open up your Bibles to James chapter 3. Spoiler alert, we're talking about James chapter 3 today. Uh, If you have your Bibles with you, open them up. If you don't have your Bible or don't have a Bible at all, we actually have Bibles here at Meadows Church we'd love to give to you so that you can have. Otherwise, pull out your mobile device, do it on there. But let's just get into the Word together. You can read it off the screen. That's always cool. But man, have have it handy so you can make highlights, so you can make notes in your Bible or whatever you like to do to be able to remember things. But according to James, what we say can determine our direction, right? He compares the tongue to a bit and bridle in a horse's mouth. Or kind of more relatable to me, at least. I've never never captained a boat, but I just kind of get the concept of the rudder on a ship better than the bit and bridle in a horse. I'm neither a captain of a ship nor a horseman, in case you can't tell uh, by just, you know, looking at me. But... I I love this picture of a rudder steering the ship, but he makes a point to call out that the rudder doesn't necessarily turn the ship. It's the captain that decides what course the ship is going to take. The rudder does control which way the ship's going to go, but who's the one in control at the wheel? The captain. And I think in terms of what we speak, I want to ask the captains of Meadows Church, the captains of all of our own individual ships here, what direction are your words taking you? Where are your words taking you? Are they reflective of dynamic faith, faith that moves, faith in action, or are they not so much reflective of that? James 3, 5 through 6, he continues on. He says, in the same way as the rudder or as the bit and bridle in the horse, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark. Look at this. I have a visual aid. A tiny spark, there it is, look at that. A tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It's a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. A verse that I thought uh, that ca- called back to memory as I was reading this from James is Proverbs 18:21, and I picked the message translation. I just love how just straight up, brutally honest this is. Look at it on the screen here. Words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. That leads me to the main point today. I'm going to steal it straight from. I think it's Eugene Peterson made that paraphrase of the of the of the word of God, but. If you're writing stuff down, write this down, by the way. If you're not writing stuff down, write this down, okay? The main point, your words are either poison or fruit, right? Your words are either poison or fruit. And what did they add at the end there? You decide. You decide. It's interesting to me that James includes a a piece of this into, into God's word, into something that we're supposed to really understand and take home because there's nothing passive about the words that we choose to speak. And there's no third option in that verse, right? There's no third option in that main point right there. Your words are either poison or fruit. They either kill or they give life. And because there's no third option, we have to ask ourselves the question, what are we speaking over our lives, over the lives of others, over our families, over our job, over our situation, over our circumstances? Because words what? Words matter. And words can be either poison or they can be fruit. James continues, oh, actually, before I go any further in James, I want to ask us this question. And maybe you can write this question down as well. But ask yourself this. What would your life look like if everything that you said was true? What would your life or the lives of people around you look like if everything that you said was true or came true, right? Right? Because a lot of times we can, we speak things over our life that, man, it, it's, we're going to get to that. James continues in verses 9 through 12. Sometimes the tongue praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing, they come, they come out of the same mouth. 
Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. There's got to be a better way, right? Does a spring of water bubble out both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. You know, James, I felt like he took a jab right at the beginning of this chapter, but now I feel like he's taking kind of jabs at us all because he's basically saying here, hey, just so you know, the fig tree a lot of times is better at doing what God tells it to do than you are and me. And the grapevine oftentimes is better at doing its job than you and me. And the springs and all these different things. We, I've talked about it before. It's crazy how many inanimate objects, the wind, the waves, the mountains, they're so obedient to God. They're, off, they're often the examples of obedience, right? And yet, James is having to tell us something as simple as words matter. The message translation of, of verse 12 is, is really well worded. You're not going to dip into a polluted mud hole and get a cup of clear, cool water, are you? It's a rhetorical question, but it's worth asking. And I think it's interesting that he includes this. The same tongue, he said it in verse 9. The same tongue that praises our Lord and Father. The same tongue that says, we're getting ready for you. We'll shout till the whole world hears it. We'll sing till the whole world knows King Jesus. He is faithful. The same tongue that praises God on Monday is calling our coworker a moron. On, or on Sunday is calling our coworker a moron on Monday, right? You're flipping off the person in traffic. And I'm not speaking at anybody. I'm talking directly with you because I'm as guilty as anybody else. This is something that's really been tough for me. John Maxwell who is an incredible leader. If you've never heard of John, John Maxwell, I encourage you to go on Amazon, type in his name, just order a bunch of his books. It's, it's a good idea, I'm telling you right now. But he pointed out something to me in a book that I'm reading of his that I found to be really valuable insight into the way that I tend to think. He says that we tend, as, as human beings, just in general, we tend to judge other people by their actions, and we tend to judge ourselves by our intentions, a lot of times, we get the benefit of the doubt because we know, oh, I was going to do, I was, I didn't mean to forget that. I didn't mean to, to do that. I didn't, we judge ourselves by our intentions and we judge other people by their actions, which is not fair, right? And I love that he said that. But how many of you know this? Even if you speak negatively about somebody behind their back when they can't hear you, it's still poison. It's not just poison when they can hear it. It's poison when it comes out of your heart and out of your mouth. And I think that's so powerful for us to know. Pastor Monty says this all the time. Love assumes the what? The best. Love assumes the best. And ever since I heard him say that, I can't remember the first time he said it, but I do try to implement that into my life, right? I try to assume the best about others. I would consider myself pretty optimistic by nature, but there is a cynical side of me, you know? There's a cynical side of me that, you see other people struggling because it's never yourself struggling, right? You see other people struggling, you're like, why can't they just figure it out? Why can't they just do it the way that I said? Why can't they just do what they heard you say in church every Sunday for the last five years? That's, I mean, I struggle with that as well, but I think it's, it's funny how we judge other people by actions, not ourselves. You know, you know, we judge ourselves by our intentions, right? Love assumes the best. I think God's been helping me with that, and I, I, I pray that he will for you as well. But I'd be willing to guess that even if you feel like you're really great at encouraging people, even if you feel like you're really great at saying kind words, even if you feel like you're batting a thousand when it comes to, oh, I'm never critical of anybody. I'm, I'm, I'm always giving grace. I'm always patient. I'm always kind. I'm always gentle. The Holy Spirit flows through me 100% of the time. Even if that's you today, I would guess that many, most, if not all of us in this room need to understand that this verse that James is talking about, it's not just talking about others made in the image of God. Because who's the person that's made in the image of God that we're often cursing the most? Ourselves, right? I, I, I say that, of course, we judge people by their actions. We judge ourselves by our intentions, but... Man, in moments of weakness, I guarantee you we've said things to ourselves that we would regret saying to somebody else. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about how we can spend so much intentional effort and time trying to be a kind person, 
to other people, trying to speak blessings over others, trying to be encouraging. When somebody comes to us with a struggle, we're like, let's go pray about that. Let's pray. And we pray and speak life into their situation, right? We say, God, help this person with their addiction. God, help this person restore their marriage. God, help this person to get the job of their dreams. God, help this person to find somebody that they can confide in and and somebody that they can confess to and somebody that they can do life together with. We speak life into a lot of these situations. We speak poison into our own. Let me give you a few examples of things I know that I've said. Maybe you can relate. I'm such an idiot. I'm so stupid. I'm a failure. I don't deserve God's grace. I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve to be blessed. I'm not worthy to sit in a church service. I can't even walk through the doors without being embarrassed. I wish I was dead. I don't belong. I don't fit in. My situation is hopeless. That's just my luck, right? How many of you have ever said that? It's just my luck. I'm such a screw up. I'll never amount to anything. I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. I'm a horrible dad. I'm a horrible husband. I'm a horrible mom. I'm a horrible wife. We say these things and may even disguise them as humility, right? If you're trying to disguise a complete and utter lie about yourself uh, as humility, I want to encourage you today to stop doing that because it's not humility. You know, what's the classic line? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. But humility is so much more than that. Humility is not just thinking of yourself less. It's going out of your way to serve other people and to believe the best, not just in them, but in you as well. you got to believe the best for yourself. If love assumes the best, you got to start by loving yourself, right? Speaking the truth in love, it applies not just to you, to others, but you, to yourself. You got to be as good of a friend to yourself as you are to everyone else. Remember the great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, can you really love your neighbor as yourself if you hate yourself? If you don't love yourself, or at least understand how much God loves you, how much he cares for you. So what direction are your words taking you today and every day? Are they leading you closer to faith that moves or are they pulling you further away? Are your words poison or are they fruit? Are they killing or are they giving life? I don't know who needs to know this today, all of us, but maybe specifically somebody you need to know that you are created in the image of God. You're created in the image of God, and you wouldn't just walk up to somebody here today, let's say. You wouldn't just walk up to somebody and say any one of those things that I just said. At least I hope you would never do that, right? We wouldn't do that, and yet we say them to ourselves. We're so willing to say them to ourselves. Think about if somebody said that to your kid, if you're, if you're a parent. Think if somebody said to your kid, you're such a failure, you're such a moron, you're such an idiot. I want to punch that guy in the throat. And it's a guy, of course. I'm not punching a woman, of course. I mean, but you, you would get angry. You'd be filled with anger. Why? Because somebody's saying that to your kid. Somebody's saying that to somebody that you love with everything you've got. Somebody that you would die for, right? Guess what? When we say that to ourselves, God's a God who has righteous anger, right? But I guarantee it doesn't make him proud to hear us say that about ourselves. He's not sitting there like, good. This is good. This is a good form of repentance. I like hearing you say this. I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're upset about your sin. <laughs> you know, that's not how God works. It's not how he is. It pains him. It pains him so much when we're hurting and we're feeling that way. He already hurts bad enough than to hear us say things that don't come into accordance with what his word says. Things that are blatant, flat out lies, even if it's the way you're feeling in a moment. The truth that I know is that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When you've been made new, when you've been set free, you're no longer a failure even when you fail. You're no longer a screw up even when you screw up. You're no longer X, Y, or Z when something happens. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And as Romans remind us, we're not to abuse that gift from God, right? We can't abuse the grace of God by just saying, well, I'm covered by grace. Get to go do whatever I want now, baby. Like, we can't just do that. But 
in the midst of those moments of failure, of trial, of feeling less than, of feeling worthless, man, you can't come into agreement with those thoughts. You have to remember that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that you are created in his image, that you were worth Jesus Christ going to the cross and dying to save because he did. He loves you. Tiny spark, visual aid. Here we go. Tiny spark. There it is. Tiny spark can set a great forest on fire, which leads me to this. Our words, well, they have generational impact too, right? We think so often the tiny spark might just let light this one tree on fire and be like, all right, I, I, I'm condemning myself. It's not affecting anybody else, but I guarantee you somebody else will hear it eventually, and that's going to impact the way that they think because there's nothing harmless about lies spoken out loud. There's nothing harmless about lies spoken out loud. If you are a well of water, right, what kind of water are people drawing from that well? Is it good, clean water, or is it poison? Because your words impact not just you, but the people around you. And if you don't think that you have people around you, I promise you, you do. You have people who watch what you do. You have people who follow what you do. Remember the story that I told at the beginning? I compliment my mom. What does my brother try to do? He tries to give my mom another a compliment, right? He's following in the footsteps, seeing I, he got affirmation. I want to say something nice. Well, I think a lot of times we can do that with our negativity as well. We bring something to the table. We come into agreement in our heart with a lie, and we speak it out loud, and we think that it's harmless. We think that it's only going to impact us, but it doesn't. It impacts everyone around us. And what I'm saying, this is so much more than just the power of positive thinking, right? I'm not saying to you to wake up every day and say, all right, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to have this. I'm going to have that. I'm going to get all the things that I want. I'm not saying that, right? I'm not saying try to speak into existence all the cool things that you want in this world. Remember, Rachel just talked about that red piece on this rope here representing our life here on the earth. It's so small. And I'm not saying don't hope for the things. Hope for the best. Hope for the best. But I'm not saying to to say, all right, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to manifest it every single day. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that what we say makes immediate and generational impact. It's a tiny spark that can set a great forest ablaze. And I've had plenty of moments throughout my life where, man, I've, I've fallen into a moment of weakness and said something that I wish I wouldn't have. And I know that you have too. But a specific example that comes to mind, it happened pretty recently, or it's, it's been happening pretty recently. I don't know how many of you know this about me. I, I do work part-time for Meadows Church, which I'm so thankful for. I'm so blessed for that. Uh, and I love getting to serve in this, in this house and with this body of believers. But I do have a full-time job or a couple of jobs outside of this. I write about football for a living. I don't know how many of you really care about football. Uh, and I try to, like, when people ask me, what, do you, what is it that you do? And I try to explain it as, like, concisely as I can without being like, I'm the, I'm the site expert of such and such website and such and such website, and I have a podcast. I, I talk about football is essentially what I do. And my job is, is kind of unique in that, like, I get to kind of make it what I want it to be. It was a side hustle for me in college that upon moving here and leaving my job in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, to come be part of Meadows Church, I then started to kind of try to do it full time and make it like my thing. But I get paid essentially a commission, right? So I write an article. If it gets a lot of views, I get more money. If it doesn't get any views, I don't get money. I don't have a, like a, here's your monthly base. Like I don't have a base salary or anything like that. It's like a game. Every month it resets back to zero. And it's like, all right, how high can you get it? And God has been so faithful with that. I just want to, I want to preface what I'm about to tell you by saying that God has been so faithful through it, like, I turned something that I, I thought was a hobby in college into a full-time sustaining job that I'm able to do, and God gets all the glory for that. But that doesn't mean it, it doesn't come without struggles, right? It does come with struggles. It's, it's hard. It's a hard job to have, and it's a huge responsibility. For reference, I have two websites. Each website has to get up to 100 posts every month. I'm not in charge of all 100 posts, but... I'm in charge of making sure we maximize the amount of views on every single post. And I, I might have a dozen or more writers on each of the sites. I edit their stuff. I write my own stuff. 
we publish it, it goes out into the Google machine, and we let it fly. And sometimes, well, it doesn't fly. And it's like I could spend an entire day writing 10,000 words on something that I think is going to absolutely crush, and it absolutely crushes me. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got 2,000 views on a post that took me all day. And it's tough. It's tough. That unpredictability is very hard for me. It's very frustrating. So I just want to be candid with you for a moment and let you know that over the last couple of months, it's been a grind, okay? I don't know how many of you know the NFL draft just happened. I have, I have tons of posts coming in from other people submitting me stuff. I'm editing stuff. I'm trying to write stuff to, to get as many views as possible. And it's not happening, it's not happening, on, specifically on the NFL website that I'm on. The Denver Broncos site is, is doing great, by the way, just so you know. The Denver Broncos stink. My Denver Broncos site is great. But this NFL site that I write for is really, really struggling, and it's starting to tick me off. I took this job uh, a couple years ago, the, the biggest site in our company. It's the biggest one historically, tens of millions of views, typically throughout the, the course of a month, not just a year. But, like, I, I inherited this site that gets millions of views per month. And they basically told me, hey, bas you can pretty much just put it on autopilot. You're going to cap out at your maximum payment every month. And I was like, well, that's sweet. That's awesome. I'd love to do that. So I took the job. And lately, the, the Google algorithm or whatever it is is not working for our website like it used to. So my views have taken a huge shot, a huge shot. And I can't understand why. I'm like, all right, God, I, I, I'm, I'm getting up in the morning. I'm reading my Bible. I'm writing down my, my soap notes, my, my, my Bible notes. I'm praying. I'm, you know, uh, I'm reading my daily affirmations. I'm doing all these things. I'm leading worship at your church. I'm like, why aren't you holding up your end of the bargain? Where are you, man? Uh, but I, I understand that's not how it works. We just get a little selfish at times, right? But uh, so the views are struggling. So mentally, I'm struggling. And emotionally, this is where I tend to struggle because I'm a doer. I need to, like, if something's not working, I need to fix it as quick as possible. If there's a conflict, I need it resolved as quickly as possible. So I'm toiling and toiling and toiling to make it better. I'm writing more. I'm staying up late. I'm getting up early. I'm commissioning other stuff to other people. I'm trying everything that I can to get the views up, and it's not happening. It's not happening. So I'm getting frustrated. And as I'm getting frustrated... I'm taking it out on the people that I love the most. Of course, my family, right? They get the worst of me because everybody else gets the best of me. I put on my best when I come out, and that's not to say that, I, that I'm fake in front of all of you. That's not the case. But I, 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 I understand that I have to give God my best even when I'm feeling weak. And I hope you understand that too. It's a moment of weakness for me that I just kind of let my emotions out in front of my kids sometimes. And I get angry. And... So my kids and my wife, they were like, let's, uh, let's plan the ideal Disney trip. We love going to Disney World, by the way. So they're like, let's plan the ideal Disney trip, a 10-day trip, eight days at the parks. Let's, let's like write it all down and, and pick all the fun things that we'd want to do. So they did that, and they're like, Dad, we want to we wanna tell you about what the ideal Disney trip is. And I'm like, well, you guys didn't include me in that, so why would I want to? I'm, I'm seriously like at this point of pettiness, at this level of pettiness. And so I sit there, and I reluctantly am listening to them. And as they start talking about this Disney trip, I, I spouted off. I was like, why are we even talking about this? Like, we're not going to be able to afford to go to Disney anytime soon because of my job situation. And I said that, and my kids heard it. And at this point, like, I had been kind of, like, petty over the course of a few days in a row. So, like, my oldest daughter, she's 10, and my son, he's 6. They ran inside after I said that, and I thought, oh, no, I, like, I made them sad or whatever. But then I heard some giggling inside. We were out on the back deck. I heard some giggling inside. And as I'm talking to my wife for, you know, the hundredth time about my attitude and how I need to have a better attitude, my kids are giggling and they run outside onto the back porch. And Mila, who's like our little artsy, you know, uh, child, she comes out and she's like directing Cruz, my son. She's like, she's the director on set. She's like, Cruz, you say your line, say your line. And Cruz is playing the role of my wife, Bethany. And Cruz is like, let's talk about the ideal Disney trip. And Mila's like, why are we talking about Disney? You know, she's, she's totally making fun of me. I love it. Yeah. So Mila 
put me in my place, and I thank her for that. But I couldn't help but just laugh because the, from the mouths of babes, right? They're, they're always honest. Kids are always honest. And I loved, I loved hearing that even as much as I hated hearing it at the same time, right? I needed to hear it. I needed to, to see how ridiculous I was looking. And it's no coincidence that around the same time all this is going down, like my frustration boiling over, my stress level through the roof, like I'm, I'm starting to get like, annoyed. I'm starting to get just like ticked off. I'm starting to think like, man, I just need to quit. I just need to stop. Like, I need to cut cold turkey. I need to just get this out of my life. It was the first time in, in, that I could ever remember actually like going on to the LinkedIn website and like looking at jobs, you know. Um, I was so frustrated. And it's no coincidence that at the time of my frustration, this song from Elevation Worship came out called More Than Able. We sang it if you were here last week. The song More Than Able I, the first time that I ever heard the song, I felt like it, it was like an old friend that I knew my entire life. I hear this song, I hear the words of the song, and I hear this truth that pierces my heart and absolutely gets like just stuck in my brain. It's like, it's like a tennis ball going back and forth, or like a ping pong ball going back and forth. It's like, you are more than able you are more than able. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? And I hear this melody over and over again. And I keep on hearing it go through my head, even as I'm getting ticked off, even, and as I'm getting frustrated, as I'm feeling worthless, as I'm feeling hopeless, as I'm feeling like I'm failing my family, like I'm failing as a dad. I can't, I can't provide for my family. I'm not doing the right. I must be doing something wrong. I'm not trusting God's punished me. God's punishing me. He must be. That's got to be it. What am I doing wrong? Where is the, what, what do I have to unplug and plug back in to get this thing back going? Now, this is what I'm thinking to myself, and I keep hearing, you are more than able. You are more than able. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? And I hear this melody, these lyrics getting stuck in my head, and I start to think to myself as I'm getting made fun of by a 10-year-old, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that God's more than able? And I know it's the Holy Spirit asking me that question. It's not me in my own strength saying, do you really, you know, because I'm talking about we can't punish ourselves. The Holy Spirit convicts. Do you really believe that God is more than able? Can you really sit there at the end of the day and say to yourself, who am I? Who am I to deny what the Lord can do. I thought to myself, why would I sit here and speak lies over my life, giving the enemy a foothold, when I have the chance to do the things that I sing and talk about every single week here at Meadows Church? The things that we hear Pastor Monty say, the truth that I read in God's word, which of course never left me, because why? Because it's written in my heart. I want you to know that no matter how discouraged you are about your current situation and circumstance, what's written on your heart can't be taken from you by anybody. Not the devil himself could separate you from the love of God. Nothing high, nothing low, nothing on heaven and earth could separate you from God's love. So do you really believe that today? Do you really believe that God's more than able? Instead of wallowing in self-pity, I thought, man, I needed to take a little bit of my own advice and go to God like David did. David set a great example for us when it comes to crying out to God rather than coming into agreements with lies from the enemy. David says a lot of things. If you've read through the Psalms, you might even think that David was bipolar. I don't know, I don't know what his situation was, but he starts off some Psalms like super upset, super angry at God or at others. And he says some things that you're like, how is this even in the Bible, you know, like, I, what am I reading right now? I found the perfect example for what I'm talking about here. Crying out to God, Psalm 13, crying out to God instead of speaking a curse over your life. David's taking what's hurting inside here, and he's bringing it to the one who can actually do something about it. He says, oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with the anguish in my soul? with sorrow in my heart every day. How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O Lord my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes, or I will die. 
Don't let my enemies gloat, saying, we have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. But I trust in your unfailing love. You are more than able. I will rejoice because you've rescued me. You are more than able. Right? I will sing to the Lord because he's good to me. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? That's what he's saying right there. No matter what. How long will you forget me? How long will you look the other way? How long do I have to struggle with this anguish, with sorrow in my heart? How long will the enemy have the upper hand? I will sing to the Lord because he's good to me. Cry out to God instead of coming into agreement with those lies. You don't have to come into agreement with those lies. You have the authority to reject the lies of the enemy. And like I said earlier, what's in your heart ultimately comes out of your mouth, right? So what's in your heart? You got to first agree with a lie in your heart in order to speak it out loud, right? So what's in your heart? Or better question, who has your heart? Have you surrendered to Jesus Christ, the one who makes all things new? Jesus, some may call him the brother of James, uh, and he was, actually, if you didn't know that. Jesus and James, they were brothers. Uh, They just have different dads, so... um, (laughs) <laughs> you like that? Write that one down. Uh, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 12. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, James heard him say this at some point or another. He says, a tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, well, its fruit will be bad. You brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever in your heart determines Whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. I love that Jesus said that, or at least that this translation included that, because what's a treasury? It's a place where you store stuff, right? So not only do you have to come into agreement with a lie or a truth, you have to actually store that stuff up before it starts to come out. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. There's nothing inconsequential about a lie spoken out loud. There's nothing harmless about a lie spoken out loud. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. I'm so grateful for Jesus, that he changes us, that he transforms us, that he took the weight of our sin and shame to the cross, that he died and resurrected from the grave so that we could be set free. It's the most amazing gift that could ever be given. And I'm so thankful for these words of James where he lets us know that words can either be poison or fruit. They can either kill or give life. That's what we need to know today, that your words matter. Your words make an eternal difference and impact What do we need to do about it is the question. Because we're talking about faith in action. We're talking about dynamic faith. We're talking about faith that doesn't just stay dead at hearing the truth that, oh, yeah, words are poison or fruit. That's that's good. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. Okay, uh, when are we golfing later? You know, when's the game on? You know, we got to actually do something about it, right? So what are we going to do? Well, I think I say this pretty much every time I've gotten up here ever. But we got to get into God's word. You got to get into God's word every single day. Every single day. Pastor Monty says 10 minutes a day for the rest of your days will change your days. I guarantee you, you can't live the life that you are purposed and planned by God himself if you're not in his word. Why? If you want to speak the truth over your life and the lives of others around you, how can you do that if you don't know the truth? The truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. How can you how can you show people the love of the Father if you don't have a well-worn path to him yourself? Wear out the path between you and God. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you through God's word. Again, I, I, we have Bibles here. If you need a Bible, grab them before you leave. Ask somebody at guest services before you leave. If you have a phone, which I assume everyone in here does, download the Bible app. 
get into God's word every single day. If you don't know where to start with that, I would say start in the gospel. Start with where, what Jesus says in the New Testament, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, a great place to start. A great place to, to receive from God so that you can speak truth everywhere that you go. We're going to do things different today than we usually do. If you come to Meadows, normally we typically close with a closing song. But I'm going to invite our prayer warriors to come and spread around the room. And we're going to pray together. We're going to pray together and, and practice what we're preaching today. Speaking encouraging words over ourselves, over each other. Whether it's you want to pray with a prayer warrior, awesome. If you want to pray in groups at your chairs with your family, awesome. However you want to do that we got to start by praying and believing these good things that we want to see God do in and around and through our lives. Amen? we got to get that, I don't want to speak poison anymore. I want to speak life over myself, over my situation, over others. I want to be encouraging. I want a fresh start today. I want good fruit today. And today, if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ and say, look, I'm, I'm done trying to do it my way. I've been trying for way too long. If you want to surrender your life to him, come and meet one of these prayer warriors and pray that prayer. Say, Jesus, I repent of, of all the things that I've done, the countless times that I've made mistakes, and I thank you that you are the God of second chances. Just tell him. Tell him what's on your heart. Tell him what's going on. Cry out to God. But these next moments, we're going to spend in intentional prayer. So I'm excited for that. I also want to encourage you, too, before we spread out and do this, I want to encourage you to schedule a time to be at Garden Prayer Room. Garden Prayer Room happens on Sundays at 1 o'clock here in this room. And I just, I promise you, time with the Father is never wasted. You may spend all day serving here at the church, and that's awesome. Come and pray at 1 o'clock one of these days. Schedule a time to be here. Come and be with God. Nobody's going to see you. Nobody's going to really know that you did that except for maybe your family. But guess what? God's going to know. And he may say something to you in that space that you would never otherwise hear. He may reveal something to you in that space that you would other never wise see. He may bring healing into an area of your life. He may do something miraculous in those moments that you spend alone with just him. So I want to encourage you to, to, to do that. I also want to encourage you, we have communion available in the prayer room like every single week. I don't know if you know that. We have communion available. If you want to just spend time intentionally with the Lord, have that communion, have that time to just remember the sacrifice that Jesus made, to remember that he died for us and bled for us and rose for us and allows us to partake in that resurrection life, please feel free to do that. Go, go be in the prayer room. Um, but after I say amen, I want to just invite you, come pray with a prayer warrior. Group up at your chairs and pray together. We want to be, we want to be a church where prayer is essential, right? Because if prayer is not essential to our church, then our church isn't essential. we got to pray. we got to seek the Lord. we got to give him everything we got. God, I'm so grateful for this church family. I'm so grateful for you. I'm so grateful for how you love us. And I'm grateful that our words carry supernatural power. And I just pray that we do the right thing and seek out the one who is the way, who is the truth, who is the life, that we know the truth so intimately that we can speak it into every area of our lives, into the lives of others, that we can have peace in situations that it doesn't make sense, that we can know that you are faithful, that you are able, that you are more than able in every circumstance. Jesus, we love you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Church, pray together. We love you so much. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day. We're so thankful for you. We'll see you soon. Hey, I want to thank you so much for watching today. But don't stop there. I want to invite you to like or subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video, update, or message. But not only that, share this message with a friend. I mean, there are so many people out there hurting, struggling, and you have the ability to make an impact in their life. And finally, if, you're, if you live in the Omaha area, I want to encourage you, come join us on a weekend service. We would love, love to meet you. God bless you.